All right, it's time already to start. Good morning, everybody. Hello, morning. Hola. Um, thank you for being here in this presentation uh, about a micronaut. I hope you're really uh, excited about it, as we are. And um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is a, a presentation about the, uh, the framework, and then there is a follow-up workshop if you want to attend it. I, I recommend it. Um, so, a uh, little bit about myself. Uh, I'm, my name is Alvaro Sánchez. I'm coming from Madrid, Spain. Uh, this is my fourth great conf, I think. Um, I started as a developer in 2001, in, you know, mostly in the Java Spring ecosystem. The audio is lost. And uh, that works, okay. Uh, and I became a Grails fanboy uh, since a uh, very early version, like uh, 2009 or something like that, so probably nine, nine years. Uh, three years ago, I joined OCI the, uh, on the Groovy, Grails, and now Micronaut team. And uh, yeah, it's great. Um, just as a personal note, I became a father last year, so um, you know, I do many things, but uh, sleeping is not one of them, so... Um, I hope you for, uh, forgive me if I make any mistake here. Anyway, uh, before we continue, a uh, little, little bit about yourselves. So, how many of you is using Grails here? Uh, Spring Boot without Grails? That's cool. Uh, anything else like Vertex? No? Okay. And um, Ratpack? Okay. That's cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, uh, first of all, this is a work in progress, which means we uh, released literally last night the first milestone, and um, it's per uh, uh, comprehensive already, so there's a bunch of uh, features you can use uh, already, but uh, before we go to the final 1.0 version, uh, we, made, we might uh, change a few things. Uh, um, and the, you know, the, the GA version is expected uh, by the end of the year, so there's a few months still before we get there. So uh, the idea about Micronaut is that you have, um, uh, I want you to get uh, the blue words uh, as an idea. You have the productivity uh, of Grails. So many of you are using Grails already, that's great. Uh, you've used to many things that Grails uh, brings to you to make your life easier. Um, and most of, many of those features that you're used to are already in Micronaut. Uh, on the other hand, the other feature is the performance, and th that's the difference. So uh, let me clarify that Micronaut is not based on, on anything Grails is based on. So you know Grails is based on Spring Boot. Uh, Micronaut is not. Micronaut is uh, built from scratch uh, or for, from the ground up, um, based on Netty. And Netty, for the ones who doesn't know that, uh, Netty is not a shared container, um, unlike, for instance, Spring Boot. Of course, had to happen now. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, Netty is a non-blocking uh, HTTP server, very low level. And uh, we built on top of that. It's the same uh, approach that uh, Vertex, for instance, is, is taking. Vertex is also based on, on Netsy and, and Ratpack as well. Um, and it's reactive. Uh, reactive means that we support any reactive streams in implementation. So uh, you can use Arc Java 2, 3, Aka, uh, any reactive stream implementation for the JVM or even if you like, the plain old completable future. Uh, Micronaut is really fast, uh, believe me. So uh, the JAR files are really small. I've got uh, comparison numbers there. So uh, against the uh, plain, um, like, you know, the Hello World. In, in Micronaut, you get a 8 megabyte uh, JAR file in, in Java. With Groovy, is a little bit uh, bigger, but not much. And the difference with um, with Spring is uh, or Spring or Grails is 
um, noticeable. Also, the heap size. Uh, the memory footprint is, is, is pretty slow, right? There's very few things on the heap uh, at the beginning. And uh, there's also a difference on the startup time. Uh, you know, even um, Hello World in Rails or Spring Boot takes how much? Five seconds, four seconds, so, or even more. Uh, in Micronaut, is, uh, most of the times it's uh, less than a second, so it's really fast. And if you don't believe me, uh, because I'm probably biased, uh, you can believe this guy. So <laughs> there's people already trying it. Uh, so uh, this is true. It happens. It's really fast and uh, lightweight. Features of the framework. Um, we're, we're covering part of these um, features in the workshop. So if you really want to try it yourself, uh, um, go attend to the workshop. Uh, what I'm doing here is to do a helicopter view of the, uh, all the features with, most of the features with, we've built into the framework. Uh, and the core one is the, uh, in the, depend the, uh, dependent the DI framework, sorry. Uh, we built uh, from scratch uh, dependency injection framework, right? Uh, the, uh, game chain, the game changing uh, feature here is that uh, while it is uh, it's inspired from Spring in, this, in the way that the concepts uh, are the same as in Spring. And uh, the reason is that imagine, you know, um, an object which is m whose life cycle is managed by the uh, dependency injection container, right? Uh, we could call this, I don't know, uh, an object managed or something like that, but we decided to call it a VIN, because a VIN, uh, because a VIN is what is, uh, you know, Spring calls that. So we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, and uh, we use uh, concepts and terms that are familiar to everybody. So the idea is that if you're coming from, uh, from the Spring or Rails world, uh, it should be really easy for you to, to, to get uh, started with Micronaut. So it's inspired in the, uh, the terms and concept, but uh, the, uh, unlike Spring, it's compile time. So if you know a little bit about how Spring works, Spring is heavily based on reflection. And um, uh, that has a, a big uh, performance and memory footprint penalty, right? So. Uh, mm, it's really slow, and it's much worse in groovy applications because, uh, you know, when you use a Spring Boot with uh, Java, that's okay. This is still a reflection-based and runtime proxy-based, uh, but in groovy it's much worse. So uh, that's the difference with Micronaut. We do not anything uh, at runtime or anything in the, in the dependency injection world, right? We do everything at compile time. How? Uh, with, for Java and Kotlin, because uh, we support uh, also uh, not only Groovy, but also Java and Kotlin, because why not? So um, the way we do that is with uh, APT, which is a, a, um, a Java, uh, the JDK uh, annotation processing tool. Uh, is similar to an AST transformation for Groovy, right? And the idea is a compile time hook we take to uh, manipulate the, the uh, generative bytecode to ensure that, um, you know, if you're injecting one particular VIN, you'll get it, right? Um, the annotations you can use are standard. We are not creating our own, so we're using all the Java -IC uh, Java X uh, packages wherever possible, right? We're not, but uh, there are also Spring-like annotations if you want. Uh, so this will be the most simple example, or one of the most simple examples. Uh, to de to uh, declare a bin as part of the, uh, con the application context, uh, you can use the add singleton annotation on it, right? Uh, and then to inject that bin into uh, another collaborator, uh, you can use the, um, I don't see, okay. uh, use the at inject uh, annotation. 
So both are annotations from the Java X dot inject package. Okay. Um, you can inject basically anything. Uh, like for instance, uh, well, any type of course, or any optional uh, of a type. Uh, you can you can also annotate your uh, your dependencies with at nullable. Um, you can uh, inject a list of things, a stream of any bin, a native array, um, or you can use the, uh, the javax.inject.provider whenever you have a circular dependency. We also have bin qualifiers. So in this case, um, we have two bin definitions. One is uh, V6 engine and the other one is V8 engine, both implement an, uh, an interface. Uh, so we can take, take advantage of this prefix and request for, for a particular uh, qualifier, in this case V8, right? So what uh, Micron will do in this case is uh, search on the application context for beams implementing this interface which are prefixed with, uh, with V8. Uh, and you can turn that into your own annotation. So we could create our own annotation called V8, right? Uh, we annotate that with add qualifier and then uh, use it in our dependency injection. Uh, the VNs are refreshable, uh, similarly to what Spring Cloud does, Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. Uh, so you can annotate any uh, bin you like with that refreshable annotation, uh, which happen well, in this example, what we have here is a bin which, uh, after being created, it in, uh, initializes a string with a fixed value. And because it's a, you know, it's a, a attribute of the class, it will never change unless we do something about it. But we're marking it as refreshable. So, uh, well, you, of course, inject it as any other dependency. Um, and the way you can refresh it is uh, there is a refresh endpoint you can, you can call. And in that case, Micronaut will search for beans marked as refreshable and will reload them. And uh, you can do that programmatically as well. But there's uh, one cool feature, which is not present on Spring Boot or Cloud, and is being able to uh, refresh upon configuration changes. So I've got, a, I got here a Mongo client being definition, um, which is uh, creating basically a Mon Mongo client distance, fair enough. The cool thing here is that I'm annotating it with at refreshable and then I'm, I'm passing a configuration property prefix. So what happens here is whenever there is a configuration change uh, on any of these prefixes, uh, Micronaut will reload this bin. Will basically, uh, you'll, give it, you'll, you'll have a chance to, to rebuild your, your bin, which is cool. We can also have um, bin factories. Um, so factory is essentially a class that produces bins. We also support conditional bins. Um, it's, sim it's a similar concept to the Spring Boot auto configuration feature. Uh, there's a few differences, but uh, basically the idea is that uh, for a bin definition, this is a singleton. I'm, f I'm further, um, I'm, I'm putting conditions. So it's not going to be created unconditionally. It's only going to be created if uh, there is a data source, this is the class, the class object, right? So there is a data source class, uh, sorry, bin in the application context, and if this property is defined. If those conditions are met, then uh, the bin won't be created, so it's a conditional bin. Uh, you can have uh, many conditions, right? So in this case, for instance, I'm, I'm um, having two, a couple of conditions, so what I could do is uh, to group those conditions into my own annotation. I'm creating here at request JDBC uh, annotation, 
uh, so I don't clutter my bin definitions with many at requires, and I have uh, simply my, my uh, at requires JDBC. Uh, you can specify conditions on classes being on the class path, being bins being on the application context, environment variables, configuration properties, uh, Java versions, and uh, things like that. Uh, there's also the idea of add configuration classes, and this is this is this is also a little bit different from from, uh, from Spring Boot. So the idea is that you create for a package, you can create a package info .gruby or .java file, and you annotate the package with that configuration, and you put your conditions there, as requires or whatever. What happens is that the whole package tree will become conditional based on the uh, conditions you, you specify here. And uh, in other places, for instance, if you've got different classes and different sub packages of this one, you can require them all uh, by simply specifi uh, specifying the configuration um, package, right? Uh, beans in the application context have a life cycle, uh, so you know you can use postcustrat, predestroy, blah blah blah. Pretty basic. Configuration. Uh, we have the concept of a property source, uh, which is the same name that the Spring uses. Uh, the idea is that the configuration system can be uh, filled with values coming from different places, right? And those are the places where you can fill configuration values from. Command line, a uh, couple of environment variables. One is Micronaut application JSON, and the other one is Spring application JSON, Spring application JSON for Spring compatibility. Uh, Java system property, uh, operating system environment variables. Uh, you can have environment specific uh, properties. So the application context is also um, profile aware. So when you run an application, it runs under a profile. And you could say, you could have an application.yaml file, which is for, for all the profiles. And you could also have like a application-test.yaml, for instance, or application-aws.yaml, which is a, an actual use case you can do. You can use properties, JSON, YAML, or Groovy formats, and, um, and that's pretty much it. So how do you read configuration values? Uh, you can use the add value annotation to, uh, to be injected a particular configuration value, literally the same as a spring, uh, but there's more we do. Like for instance, we have an each property annotation. Uh, the idea is that when you have a configuration prefix, which contains a list of elements in the configuration system, so let's say I could have uh, my app dot data sources dot one, my app dot data sources dot two. With this, this annotation, I'm creating uh, a configuration class for each of those values, which is really cool, right? Uh, the next step is I've got two configurations for each of the values, I want a bin for each of them. And that's what each bin is doing. So for each bin of, of type data source configuration, I'm creating a data source factory bin, uh, sorry, a, a data source bin in this case. Uh, for other than reading single values with the add value annotation, when, when you have more, uh, it's, it's not a good idea to have your service or your controller with all the attributes and the add value annotation. So it's better to, to have a configuration class. And uh, it's type safe, uh, it's validated, it's, uh, it's really great. So you simply create a simple class with uh, the add configuration properties uh, annotation, and then you pass the, um, um, the configuration prefix. Then, uh, so I'm saying my.engine, and I have a manufacturer here that maps to uh, a YAML like this one, for instance. And it's uh, type safe. So for instance, if I'm specifying here uh, a number, and I, would, and I would enter here anything that a number, it will fail. 
and we can use uh, beam validation API annotations like uh, not blank, valid, uh, min, max, whatever, right? So all the beam validation API annotations uh, from JavaX dot, uh, don't remember, but it's JavaX dot uh, validation or something like that, uh, you can use them, right? Uh, nested properties are mapped through nested classes. That's, the, that's how you do it. I inject them like any other uh, bin in the application context. Uh, the example here is a, a, a special use case. So we've seen uh, injection of uh, attributes of your class. Uh, but that's a, it's not a good idea, so it's, it's, a, it's a better practice to declare them as constructor dependencies. And in this particular case, Micronaut, you, you, you don't need to specify are inject here, because Micronaut will figure out that you are providing a non-default constructor, so it'll know that you're asking, you need, you're, you're asking for an engine config uh, instance, so it'll pass whenever, when creating the when, when creating this bin, it'll pass an, an instance of an engine config class. There's AOP support. Uh, we use that uh, internally in the framework uh, for a few things. Like, for instance, uh, there is an around advice to uh, decorate a method or a class. We use that for, the, for instance, the history support, uh, the cache abstraction. Uh, the validation, right? But you could use it yourself if you want to decorate any method or class. And there's also um, uh, an introduction advice you can use to basically um, uh, to implement new new code. Uh, and that's how the HTTP client works. I'll talk about that later. So, for instance, uh, regarding the the cache abstraction. Uh, it's li literally the same three annotations from the spring cache abstraction. So you have a, a, a cache config, a cacheable, a cache put, cache invalidate, etc. And uh, don't remember the, the different caches this is uh, um, backed by, but I think um, by default is uh, using caffeine. It's, you can probably use eh cache or whatever, right? So the HTTP server, because uh, you'll most of the time you'll be creating uh, microservices. So the starting point is an application class. Uh, this is similar to Rails or Spring Boot today, uh, and then you will likely define controllers, right? So that's a controller is a class. You can specify here path. Um, definitions, right? Uh, and then you have endpoints. The endpoints are methods. Uh, you can annotate them with uh, add get, add post, blah, blah, blah. You can use uh, path variables like here. Uh, the difference with the spring, if, if you remember the spring MVC mappings, if you've used them uh, yourself, um, you have to to further annotate your, your signature, saying, for instance, uh, this uh, string name is an uh, at parameter, for instance. And you have to tell it's an at parameter and then pass it name. So it's not inferring the, uh, the variables, what we are. So it's less re redundant to say. And um, the return time of your endpoint is a key part of the implementation. So uh, depending on what, what, are, what you're returning, uh, Micronaut will figure out what to do. How do we test this? Uh, you can obviously create a unit test. So you, a unit test is uh, out of the scope of here because uh, you, you, know, you instantiate the class and do something at the unit level. But uh, what if I tell you that you can have in milliseconds a functional text with a client of that endpoint. That would be awesome, right? And that's essentially what, what's happening. So this single line here will start your service. That's all. 
uh, this line here will give you an HTTP client you can use, and it's attached to your uh, testing instance uh, URL. Uh, by default, it runs on a random port, so you don't care about that. So uh, the client is attached to the server. And then you can, you can make requests to your service. That's all. This is a functional test. Uh, it's not mocking. It's, it's an actual, you're making an actual HTTP request here. And this runs really, really fast. Uh, you can also use JUnit if you are into that sort of pain. Um, it's more verbose, as you, as you can see, because you have to clean up things by yourself. And uh, uh, but well, I mean, it's an option. Uh, in terms of the routing or routing, like the American says, uh, the you can use the, those annotations stuff I told you. Uh, this is the declarative uh, routing, uh, and uh, we figure out based on the, meth on the method name was the default routing for, uh, for an action. So uh, those guys here are the same mapping, right? The alternative is there is an API uh, to programmatically uh, define routes. And um, this is much, is much better than uh, URL mappings in Rails, right? So URL mappings in Rails is, when you get used to it, uh, is, is fine. Uh, but it's is the dynamic, is kind of difficult to work with, uh, is, is not typed, is not type safe, uh, but this is type safe, is static, and uh, you get auto completion, so it works. In terms of the request binding, things you can bind the request to, um, you can read the body, cookies, headers, uh, parameters, and there's a few goodies like, for instance, uh, uh, the ability to use uh, optional, uh, the uh, you know Java 8 optional over a parameter, or uh, binding of date types. Like, for instance, uh, this is a Java 8 date type. We do that for you. Uh, if you want to manipulate uh, the low-level request and response, you can do so. So you declare the request as a as a parameter of your action, as you will receive it, an instance of uh, yeah. the actual implementation is a mutable HTTP request. Um, and uh, if you return an HTTP response, uh, you'll, uh, you can, there's a mutable HTTP response object, or you can use uh, some of the uh, default uh, HTTP responses uh, we've created for you, like this is a builder. So you're creating a 200, okay, response uh, with a string, um, with a string content, content. So that's the body. Uh, you can process the request um, in a reactive way. So in this case, I'm using a publisher from Mars Java. Uh, that's a flowable. So that's a hint for Micronauts to basically do the, the parsing of the body asynchronously. Uh, and then, you know, when you do that asynchronously, it's, it would be ideal to do the response asynchronously as well. So that's what we're doing here. And uh, in terms of the responses, uh, depending on the, re the return type of your endpoint, uh, Micron will figure out uh, what to do with it. So you can return a publisher of anything, and uh, that's a hint for Micron to uh, what Micron will do is to will subscribe to that publisher and run it on the um, on the netty uh, thread pool. Uh, you can return a, lo a low level completable future or an HTTP response of anything. Of course, a plain string or any uh, pojo or pogo or whatever. And in this case. Uh, uh, we use Jackson for, for converting your class to a JSON uh, representation. Uh, the threading model is, um, is based on Netty. And uh, all the Netty based framework like uh, uh, Vertex or Ratpack are um, uh, based on two, 
basically two different of uh, thread pools. So uh, the non-blocking operations will be run on the event loop. Uh, those are meant to be, th there has to be non-blocking. You can't block the, the event loop. And then there's a relatively larger um, uh, I.O. pool for blocking operations. So for instance, when you're returning, if your action looks like this, uh, Macronaut knows it's uh, blocking, so I it'll put your, uh, your implementation in the I.O. Uh, thread pool to not block the event loop. Uh, yeah, so we you can parse. Uh, this example, for instance, we are parsing um, sorry, we are parsing the, the request body with the re uh, reactive uh, Jackson parser. But we can do it non-reactive as well. So that's it's your choice. SDP client. So we've got the server definition. Uh, we can create a client as an interface. This is similar to a retrofit, similar to f uh, Spring, uh, to Netflix uh, f uh, thing. Uh, the few all similar approaches, but again, our difference is that we generate the client at compile time. Uh, so potentially, you can use that in an Android application if you want. Also, the DI is uh, is working, and you can use it. So the idea is that you you have an interface. You uh, use the add client annotation, and Micron will figure out how to implement a cl uh, client based on the mappings you're defining here. That's all. Uh, so you're, if you remember the, uh, the first test we, we saw, we were using a low-level HTTP client. But we, it, it would be better to use you know, this high-level high HTTP client because I don't have to interact with the request and response. I just uh, use, in this case, um, you know, I, uh, I've got the request and responses encapsulated in objects. Uh, in this case, it's a stream, but it could be anything else. Our client is um, is packaged with uh, many things, like uh, it's service discovery aware with console and Eureka. It's got load balancing, reactive, it's fault tolerant. Um, there is a fallback mechanism, so whenever an exception is thrown on a client, uh, it'll run the fallback. Uh, we support uh, our client is retriable. Anything basically, anything is retriable, and um, we support the secret secret breaker pattern. Um, and we have uh, things which are really cool. Like for instance, you could use the retriable annotation on an exception. So imagine this is a uh, this is a driver builder for a service we, that can take longer to start up. So you can retry to create until the service is available. Uh, in terms of serverless, so uh, for us, for Micronaut functions are first class citizens. Uh, there's several ways you can create functions. Uh, the simplest way would be to create a Groovy script. Uh, this is a file. Uh, this will be the whole content of your function. Uh, it'll be uh, statically compiled, uh, so don't worry about that. You can use uh, dependency injection if you like. And um, uh, well, the, the idea is that you have the equivalent of a function, of a Java, Java util function implementation. So something that takes a, an argument and returns a response, right? Uh, if you are in Java, or even if you're in Groovy, but you still prefer to have a class, you can use a function bin. Uh, and then uh, you basically implement the function uh, interface from Java and do your job. Uh, you can have function clients, which are similar to the HTTP client we saw before, but they are function aware, and they are also uh, environment aware, so they, uh, they know if they are deployed on AWS, for instance, and will give you a function client attached to the AWS uh, gateway endpoint for your function. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, you can test functions 
uh, very easily, like for instance, creating the object and, and calling the method. That would be a unit test. Uh, you can test it using uh, REST calls. So out of, out of a function, you can spin up a server uh, automatically, and uh, you can use the, your function client to test it, which is cool. Or in uh, AWS Lambda. Uh, you, you still use the function client, so the function client is, is, is the same thing. The difference is the, the properties. This is a way to start an instance of an embedded server with uh, um, a particular configuration properties for this instance. And those configuration properties will tell Micronaut uh, to figure out which environment it's running into. How much time do I have left? 12? OK. Uh, I'm finishing. So uh, all the goodies we have in the framework, like for instance, error handling. We have the add error annotation, so you can react on anything happening anywhere. Um, uh, for instance, I could react whenever a bad request is returned. This is great for, uh, you know, to react the same way. Instead of, you know, handling in your controllers with if this has happened, then uh, do something. You can simply let your actions return a bad request and then this uh, hook will execute. Uh, you can react on exceptions happening uh, in the class where the error annotation is used, or you can have a global error handling for anything happening anywhere. Uh, we have filter support. And uh, the thing to understand here is that um, Similarly to the request and response we saw before, so you saw before in the endpoints we were using HTTP request and HTTP response. Those are not uh, Charlotte API HTTP requests and responses, right? So they are not. They are something else. Uh, because remember, we are not in a Charlotte container. We are not um, using the Charlotte uh, API. Uh, however, we support a similar concept to get you familiar with. Like, for instance, uh, there is this HTTP session support. Uh, and filters are the same. Those are not servlet filters. They are, uh, let's call it Micronaut filters, right? Uh, but the, the concepts are similar. So uh, there is a filter chain, uh, and filters can apply to either the request or the response or both. And they can also apply for both a client or a server, right? So you can have, for instance, an HTTP client filter, um, which adds authentication um, header to every single request. That's a use case, right? We already have a security solution in place. Once again, uh, we try to not reinvent the wheel, and we, we use the annotations that are similar in, in the Spring world, in this case, uh, Spring Security. So you can use the Ad Secure annotation. Uh, and then uh, you, you can then request for injection or for, uh, in this case, as parameter, a principal object from uh, Java Security Package. Um, this is implemented by um, the support for JWT authentication uh, LDAP database, so there's several strategies, and uh, there's actually a few guides published already on, on authentication, so this is already ready to use. Uh, there is a CLI, uh, same as, as Grails, so you use the SDK man to install the CLI, and then uh, you can use the, the CLI to create an application, to cre uh, and then to uh, it helps you get getting started with uh, creating few classes. Like, for instance, you can create a controller, you can create an HTTP client, you can create a function bin. Uh, we, the CLI uh, brings many of the features from Grails, so it's based on profiles, pretty much as Grails. Uh, the profiles are based on features, pretty much like Grails, so you'll, you'll, you'll be familiar with that. And this is still more. <laughs> 
if this weren't enough. So for instance, that's the HTTP server. We didn't talk about it, but there's SSL support. And more importantly, to use a, uh, for development if you need it. If you, if you need a self-signed certificate, is it one configuration line? It works. You don't have to mess with anything. You don't have to generate a certificate or, or JKS or whatever shit. So it just works. Micron will do it for you, which is great. There's core support if you want to use uh, this backend connected with the front end. Uh, we support server side events. Uh, so you could have a whole stack non blocking, right? Uh, your controller could be non blocking, uh, your data layer could be non blocking, etc. Uh, we have production endpoints, which is called actuators in Spring Boot. Uh, health checks, info endpoints, uh, bin definitions, uh, the refreshable uh, routes, etc. Uh, in terms of service discovery, uh, we support all these things like uh, console Eureka, uh, and also Kubernetes, AWS, and this, this, uh, the roadmap is, uh, is packed with, um, with uh, more things like, for instance, uh, Google Cloud um, Service Discovery, which I don't remember the name. It's a bit of tracing. I didn't mention I either, but uh, it's already supported. So you could tr you could um, uh, use Zipkin or well, Zipkin or Open Open Zipkin or uh, Jagger to to. Um, uh, use this with tracing in all of your micronet applications to you know to correlate requests and uh, understand the dependencies within them. And uh, in terms of data access, uh, you can use GORM of course, or or you can use something else. Uh, we've got what we call um, configurations, right? And uh, the idea of a, conf of a, um, a dependency configuration is uh, the same as um, Spring Boot started. You know Spring Boot has started from for different things, like for instance, if you want to use console, you have a um, Spring Boot sta uh, Spring Cloud started console uh, dependency. We have a similar concept. And uh, the support for SQL da databases, Hibernate, MongoDB, Neo4j, Redis, Cassandra, Kafka, RabbitMQ, plenty of stuff. So, how many of you want to try this right now? Come on, everybody, even me. So, I already tried, but I will try again. So, there's a workshop right after the, the lunch, I think, or the break. Um, so, grab that URL, go there, and you land into, let's try, See my pointer. Okay. So, what requirements uh, for the workshop? So, if you download them ahead of time, uh, it'll be better. So, you can focus during the workshop to do the the actual job. Uh, essentially, you need a CLI. So, SDK installed Micronaut. If you don't have S SDK man installed. Uh, that's a mistake, so you need it. Install SDK man. And uh, then, well, you, you have to obviously clone this repo. And uh, you need Docker. So if you don't have Docker, you'll have a problem. Four minutes. Uh, so you, you need Docker, so um, you should pull these images ahead of time as well to have them uh, in, the, in the cache already. So do Docker pull console and Docker pull Mongo because we'll use them in the workshop. And um, that's it. So 
I don't know if there's any question. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any question here? There's one there. How do I compare Micronaut with Rapac? Uh, it's a good question. So um, they are similar in the way that uh, they are based on Netty. And uh, I would say that's all the similarity I find between them. Because uh, apart from that, they're very different in terms of the productivity. So you know, Rapac is kind of low level. Uh, it's not as low level as Vertex. So there's, there's nice, uh, ni nicer things you can uh, do in Rathpack, like for instance, uh, you can use a uh, Google Juice for DI, right? But uh, first, it's not as compelling and as complete and as comprehensive as Micronaut. So uh, there's many things uh, you can use with Rathpack, but you have to bring any library to do that. So uh, we it's not our approach. Our approach is to be uh, as close as C dependency as possible. Right, so you don't have any, you don't need any uh, any other any third-party library to to have a service discovery, for instance. We support it natively. So one of the um, uh, the uh, marketing uh, com um, terms used with uh, Rathpack, sorry, with Micronaut, is that we are uh, natively cloud-native, which means that uh, from the ground, uh, the ori the original design goals were to to embrace the 12 factor um, applications, right? So service discovery is, is core for us. Uh, so yeah, for me, the big difference is the productivity. Uh, I think a developer will, should, uh, will, f will feel much more productive with Micronaut. Uh, there was a slide uh, about that. So the last item. So this is a hello world in Spring Boot or Rails. It's like it's around three, three to four seconds, and in Micronaut is uh, less than a second. Uh, the memory for p footprint as well. So you have like 40, 50 megabytes in Spring Boot and Rails, and uh, Micronet is 10 or less than that, so it's really small. More questions? Okay, thank you very much again. Hope to see you in the workshop, and uh, enjoy the conference.